Welcome to Sunday School. This is only my third time trying this one. <laughs> Someday I'm going to figure it out. Nate will be home and I won't need to do it anymore. <laughs> Will you pray with me? Dear Father God, as we look at this scripture, help us, O oh Lord, to be very cognizant of the fact that you use scripture to change us and to conform us to your will. Help us, O oh Lord, to, to listen well, to let the Holy Spirit convict us to be Bereans and, and examine if what I am saying is true and to become more holy because we have spent this time together in your word. In Jesus' name, amen. We're in 2 Timothy chapter 3. The first verse says, first verse says, but realize this, that in the last days, difficult times will come. Some people believe that the last days are the days right before Jesus comes back in the sky to get us. Other people believe that the last days started when Jesus went back to heaven and they will end when Jesus comes back the second time. I tend to agree with the second point of view. I believe that we are in the time of tribulation, that there have been people martyred for their faith all through the, the ages since Jesus went back to heaven, and that um, it really will not get better until he comes back in the sky to get us. Um, I think about Noah and the ark in Genesis 6, 5 to 8. Then the Lord saw that the wickedness of man was great on the earth and that every intent of the thoughts of his heart was only evil continually. The Lord was sorry that he had made man on earth and he was grieved in his heart. The Lord said, I will blot out man whom I have created from the face of the land, from man to animals, to creeping things, to birds of the sky, for I am sorry that I have made them. But Noah found grace in the eyes of the Lord. I pray that we also will find grace in the eyes of the Lord when he looks at how wicked and awful things are and these difficult times come upon us, that he will find us faithful to him. And as we say, why hasn't he come yet? Why couldn't he have just come last month before this happened and before that happened? And why, why is it that he's taking so long? Um, Peter talks about that in 2 Peter 3, 9. I had my Sunday school kids, 5th and 6th graders, memorize this verse back before the coronavirus. It says, The Lord is not slow about his promise, as some count slowness, but is patient toward you, not wishing for any to perish, but all to come to repentance. So why hasn't he come back yet? He is taking his good old time until we have an opportunity to witness to one more person, to live a godly life and have other people come to know Jesus through the way we act and talk. Now, it goes on to the next section, which is the reason that the times are difficult. People. People is what make the times difficult. Sinful unrepentant people. And verses two to five are one of Paul's nice long sentences. Here we go again. For men will be lovers of self, lovers of money, boastful, arrogant, revilers, disobedient to parents, ungrateful, unholy, unloving, irreconcilable, malicious gossips, without self-control, brutal, Haters of good, treacherous, reckless, conceited, lovers of pleasure rather than lovers of God, holding to a form of godliness, although they have denied its power. Avoid such men as these. And in Urban's commentary, he said that the loves are at the top of the list and the bottom of the list, and then in the middle is 15 and that they are five sets of three characteristics each. So that's how I'm going to examine them. But let's look at what the loves are first. A lover of yourself, a lover of money, a lover of pleasure rather than a lover of God. 
Okay, so because they want money, because they're worshiping themselves, and because they're seeking after pleasure, they become these awful people that are described in these verses. Okay? Um, the first set is boastful, arrogant, and revilers. I think that they follow in a sequence. I think that, first of all, I boast about my abilities. Do you see what I can do? Do you see what I can do? And then I become arrogant towards others. Well, I can do this. Why can't you do this? Well, you're not good as good as I am. Do you see how boastful leads to arrogance? And putting someone else down to build yourself up. And then the third step is they actually start reviling and persecuting others, criticizing everything that other person is doing. I wonder, is this what Timothy was putting up with in Ephesus? The next three start out with disobedient to parents, ungrateful to what others have done or given, and finally, unholy. Think about it as sarcastically mouthy towards my parents. Sarcastically mouthy towards my parents. Boy, I've lived that on the parent side of it at least. And then sarcastically mouthy towards people that have benefited me. I'm not thankful. Mouthy towards my teachers, my leaders, my boss, and then finally, mouthy and disrespectful towards God himself, becoming unholy. The next three, unloving, irreconcilable, and malicious gossips. This set makes me think about a divorce. The spouse stops intentionally loving his mate, and it gets to the point of irreconcilable differences, and then they maliciously gossip about the person that they once promised to love forever. When, when you make a vow of commitment to your husband, you are saying that you will love that person forever, no matter what. I remember a lady in our church whose husband became very... Um, he he got Alzheimer's really bad. And as he got Alzheimer's really bad, he was doing things that were very uncharacteristic of him. And it was so hard for her to, to keep those vows of love for this husband who had become mean. Um, when the spouse stops intentionally loving his mate, that love that you have for your mate is not something that you feel. It is something that you do. It is when you get out of bed and make the coffee before she wakes up. It is when you scrape off the windshield of her car before she goes to work in the morning. Those intentional things that show love, not the, um, not the feelings that you have. And then once those stop, then there are irreconcilable differences and you can't go back. And then you start to maliciously gossip about that, that person that you made these vows towards. It's crazy. I suppose it can be in a relationship between people like a mom and a, and a daughter or two sisters. Um, I think that it starts when someone says, boy, I don't love them anymore. Next one, three are without self-control, brutal, and haters of good. Seems like a per this person is spiraling down, 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 down. Without self-control. One day he stops trying to fight against temptations. He lets his lust take control of him. And then his actions towards everyone become brutal and mean because he has become someone he never wanted to be. And then he not only is brutal, but he hates good. He hates the people at church. 
He hates the Christians in his life. He hates anyone who seems to care about him. I have seen this spiral. Without self-control, chasing after your lusts, and then as you chase after your lusts, you don't you become somebody that you didn't want to be, so then you're brutal and mean with the people around you, and then you start to hate everything that is good. The next set treacherous, reckless, conceited. This man is totally out of control. Treacherous. He is actively doing evil. He is dangerous to be around. He has no regard for others and their needs. And he is so fixed on himself with conceit that he cannot see past the end of his nose. He worships himself. That's what Bert said to the children in Mary Poppins. He can't see past the end of his nose. They said, he can't see past, but it's true. You become so conceited that all you think about is yourself. You are dangerous to everybody else. What a list. What a surrender of yourself to Satan's wiles. It's just such a list of depravity. It's so sad. And it finishes with this, holding to a form of godliness, although they have denied its power. Avoid such men as these. Oh, these people were in the church. They think they're believers. They look like Christians on the outside, but they have, the, have no power of the Holy Spirit living in them. So Timothy is supposed to identify these people and avoid them. Then Paul goes on to describe their actions that he finds most revolting. Verse 6, For among them are those who enter into households and captivate weak women, weighed down but with sins, led on by various impulses, always learning and never able to come to the knowledge of the truth. They prey on the vulnerable. Almost like a drug dealer hanging out at the playground. Where the most needy people are, they try to captivate them and lead them astray, house to house even. Verse 8, just as Jannes and Jambres opposed Moses, so these men also opposed the truth. Men of depraved mind, rejected in regard to the faith, but they will not make further progress, for their folly will be obvious to all, just as Jannes and Jambres Folly was also. Who in the world are Jannies and Jambres? I looked it up. They are not mentioned any place else in the Bible. But the Jewish people knew that they were the magicians who stood at Pharaoh's side and replicated Moses' miracles, one, two, and three, when he was doing the plagues, by the power of Satan. They were Satan worshipers used by Satan powerfully in Egypt. They opposed the truth. They were exposed to Moses and the plagues and didn't repent. Now, Paul saying that these people that are opposing Timothy are just like them. Oh, Lord, let their folly be obvious to all. Up until now, Paul has been saying, avoid these people. Stay away from them. Turn away from them. Avoid these people. And now he says, Timothy, this is what you're supposed to focus on instead. Verse 10. Now, you followed my teaching, conduct, purpose, faith, patience, love, perseverance, persecutions, and sufferings, such as happened to me at Antioch, at Iconium, and at Lystra, what persecutions I endured, and out of them all the Lord rescued me. Timothy had walked with Paul for years. He had been there and seen Paul's character and could adopt the character of his great mentor, Paul's faith teaching, his conduct, the purpose that he had for his life, his love, his perseverance were all examples to Timothy. Timothy had been in Antioch when the enemies got filled with jealousy and talked abusively against Paul. He was there when they stirred up the persecution against Paul and Barnabas and threw them out. He knew what he had gone through. He was at Iconium when the plot came to mistreat them and stone them, and they had to run away from that town. 
He was at Lystra when Paul healed the lame man and they tried to worship him. And then the Jews from Antioch and Iconium came and won over that crowd. Do you remember this story? And they um, stoned Paul and drug him outside the city and thought that he was dead. And when Timothy and the others came and stood around that big pile of rocks, Paul was alive. Timothy had watched it. Timothy knew what Paul had gone through. And then Timothy knew that even though he had been mistreated in those towns, Paul chose to go back to those same towns where he was going to be mistreated so that he could encourage the young believers. He goes on to verse 12. Indeed, all who desire to live godly in Christ Jesus will be persecuted. This is a verse to be memorized. Some people think, oh, I gave my life to Christ. Everything's going to be good now. Read it again. Indeed, all who desire to live godly in Christ Jesus will be persecuted. Will be persecuted. We will be persecuted. We will stick out like a sore thumb. We will be persecuted. Expect it. Verse 13. But evil men and impostors will proceed from bad to worse, deceiving and being deceived. It will not get better. It will not get better. There will be evil men. There will be impostors. People like the ones mentioned at the beginning of this chapter and their influence will hurt you and your church also. Verse 14 and 15. You, however, continue in the things you have learned and become convinced of, knowing from whom you have learned them, and that from childhood you have known the sacred writings which are able to give you the wisdom that leads to salvation through faith which is in Christ Jesus. Jason, my son who teaches at Johnstown Christian, makes his students memorize these two verses. If you keep on keeping on in what you have learned and what you have become convinced of, and know the character of the mentor that you are following after and copying, you are going to be able to make a difference in this world. And the influence of a godly home where you learn the scriptures from childhood makes all the difference. Seth and Teresa's kids were here this week, and I spent a lot of time with Jason and Vicky's kids as well. And I was going to teach the books of the Bible on Wednesday night. So I had those kids memorize the books of the New Testament. The oldest of those kids is five. And they learned the books of the New Testament in two days. They didn't even get to my house until Monday. Monday and Tuesday, and we recorded it on Tuesday evening. You have so much more potential if you come from a house where people say, you need to know the books of the Bible and you sit down and learn them with them. When you read Bible stories, when you're raised in that kind of a house, it makes all the difference. Um, knowing God's word inside out. When Nate was in third grade, Mrs. Bowman called him the walking, talking Bible. You know what? He still is. I thought that my role as a mom was inferior to the other roles that I played, directing Wednesday night Bible study, making the phone calls that I did, teaching sisterhood. I thought those were the important things that I did and that raising my kids was just like supplemental. But I'm telling you, there's nothing that I did in my life that was as valuable as raising our kids, Earl and I raising our kids to know Jesus, to reverence the word of God, to see church as important, to see the dignity of people who are being abused. That's the most important thing that we ever did. Then the verse 16. All scripture is inspired by God and profitable for teaching, for reproof, for correction, for training in righteousness, so that the man of God may be adequate, equipped for every good work. Does it say some of scripture is inspired by God? Does it say the New Testament is inspired by God? Or just the Gospels are inspired by God? No, it says all scripture is God-breathed. All scripture is inspired by God. 
and it is to be taught. It is to discipline me. It is to make me holy. It is to be used by God for correcting me and used by me in correcting you when you get way off the path. Our righteousness is because of his sacrifice, but we are trained in righteousness by spending time in the word of God. He uses the word of God to equip us for the work he desires to do through us. If you have not yet memorized verses 16 and 17, today is the day to do it. Let's pray. Thank you, Father, for the opportunity to look at your word and to grow by it. Help us, O oh Lord, to be challenged. Help us, O oh Lord, to um, turn away from people who would destroy us and instead follow after our mentors of faith. And spend time in your word, for by it we are changed. In Jesus' name, amen.